The last part of this double agent model, which goes through all the different ways you can express and deal with problems involving rates, involves tables. And tables are quite a common way of solving rate problems. And they're quite good because they're purely experimentally derived. And you don't need to worry about whether it's elementary or non-elementary. All you look at is what the numbers tell you. And it allows you to determine not only the order with respect to each of these reactants, but also you can mathematically determine the rate constant as well. And so the way that tables work is that you essentially run a number of trials where you modify the concentrations of each of the reactants and see what happens with the rate overall. So what we have here is the list of trials, the concentration in moles of reactant A, the concentration in moles of reactant B, and then the rate. And they may just say rate, and it could be rate in reactions per second or something like that. Or it could be something like the change in C over time, because notice that the amount that C increases tells you about how quickly this reaction is going. So they could say change in A, change in C, or the change in any of the components of this reaction. But just recognize that one of these columns will express the rate and it will express it quantitatively. So when you're working with a table, you're essentially looking for two trials where one of the components stays the same and only one of them differs between trials. And so what we can do here is we can just look at these trials and figure out which ones will help us analyze the different components. When we look here, we notice that between trials two and one, B stays the same and A doubles. And what happens when A doubles is that the rate goes from 2.5 times 10 to the negative seven, and it increases to one times 10 to the negative sixth. One thing that's important to realize, and the reason that it's been set up this way, is that one times 10 to the negative sixth is four times 2.5 times 10 to the negative seven. And the reason for that is that 10 times 10 to the negative seven is equal to one times 10 to the negative sixth. And so what we see here is that between these two trials, as we leave B constant and we double the amount of A, what we see is that it's a fourfold increase. It goes from 2.5 times 10 to the negative seven and increases to 10 times 10 to the negative seven, or one times 10 to the negative six. And so what we see is that when we double the amount of A, the rate quadruples. And so that means that it's second order with respect to A. And a way we can know that is we can look at the change in the rate, and we can express that change in rate as the change in the amount of A raised to whatever order it is. And so notice that the rate went through a fourfold change and A doubled. And so we have to figure out what exponent we could use there in order for these two to be equal to each other. And so that way we know that it is second order. And so essentially when you're looking at these, a lot of times just look at what happens to the rate and figure out what order it would have to be in order for something like a doubling of A to equal a quadrupling of the rate. It would have to be two to the second power. If you doubled A and the rate simply doubled, then it would be the first power. It would be two to the first power. And if you doubled A and the rate didn't change at all, then you're looking at a zero order reaction. It's zero order because two to the zero power equals one and there is no change in the rate. So if changing the amount of A has no effect whatsoever on the rate, you know it's zero order. But what we have here is a doubling of A that causes a quadrupling of the rate. And so that means you're looking at A being raised to the second power here. Now with B, we need to find a trial where B changes, but A doesn't. And so here we have the first and third trials where A remains constant there and B triples from here to there. And notice what happens to the rate overall when you triple B. You go from one times 10 to the negative six to three times 10 to the negative six. And so what that means is when you triple 
B, the rate triples. And so we can express this change in rate, you see a tripling of the rate, and that equals the change in B. So here we're looking at the change in B, and remember that that change in B is three, raised to some power of the order. And the order here is the, the exponent that we'll have to raise three to in order to equal three. And so we know that it's first order with respect to B. And so now we can re-express this rate law as rather than saying a to the alpha, we can say a to the second, because when we doubled a, we saw a quadrupling of the rate. So that's double squared. And so you see a fourfold change. And b, we already have just gone through this. When you triple b, you see a tripling of the rate. And so that's three to the first power. And so it's going to be first order with respect to b. And so we know with this type of reaction that we're going to express the rate in terms of A and B because those are the two reactants. But with these tables, now we can experimentally determine the order of them, and we've done that by showing that it's second order with respect to A and first order with respect to B. And the nice thing about this is that not only can we figure out those, but we can also go ahead and solve for K, the rate constant, because K is going to be the number that allows all of these to add up. And so we can plug in this value for the rate. And it's nice to use this because we have A at one mole and B at one mole, so it creates simple calculations. We can plug in this number for the rate here. And then we can just simply use the values. So we can use molarity of A equals one. So we have one to the second power. Molarity of B equals one, and so we have one to the first power. And then k is whatever number it has to be in order for this to work out. Now we don't have to use this trial. We could use this trial, or we could use this one. We could use any of the trials and simply plug in this number for a, this number for b, and this number for rate. And what we would find is that k will be the same no matter which trial we use in order to do this calculation. But in order to do that, you need to know the rate rather than just the change in one of the reactants. So you need to express that in terms of the rate. And sometimes you can do that easily, other times you won't, but it'll often be given to you as a pure rate. And then your job is simply to figure out what's going to happen here. So for this one, we, we can do some simple calculations. 2.5 times 10 to the negative seven equals K times one squared and one to the first power. And so ultimately, k here times one times one equals the rate. And so we know that k will have to be 2.5 times 10 to the negative seven. But notice how simple tables are. You don't need to worry about whether it's elementary or non-elementary. You don't have to bother with graphs and things like that. And ultimately, it's purely experimental numerical results that can allow you to quickly calculate what order it is by looking at everything else being maintained the same and just changing that one variable and then seeing what happens to the overall rate. So you can figure out the order of each of these reactants. And then you can just plug in the rate and these two concentrations for any of these trials and you can then calculate what k the rate constant is. And so tables are a very, very helpful way of solving rate problems because you can simply do numerical comparisons and get all of these values, whether it's elementary, non-elementary, or any number of different permutations of rates. So what we've done is we've gone through the double agent model for examining rates. You can express rates in terms of a universal expression, which is just that the rate equals some constant times reactant raised to some power times another, the other reactant raised to its own power. So that's how you can express all rates, and it's the most common way that you will see rates being used. But notice that these aren't always the stoichiometric numbers. These aren't the stoichiometric coefficients that you raise that rate to. If you want to, you can also use the Arrhenius way of expressing rates. And the Arrhenius model considers the orientation and the energy 
as well as the activation energy and the temperature. So it's a formula that the rate equals Zp e to the negative activation energy over RT, or you can simply multiply Z and P together and make that A, the Arrhenius constant. Those are the two ways you can express rates. You'll see this one more frequently, but know the Arrhenius model. It's a collision-based model. And then you can solve rate problems in a number of different ways. If you're given graphs, you simply plot one quantity versus time, and whichever one of those gives you a straight line, it tells you that that's the order of a single reactant reaction. Now, if you have an elementary reaction, one that occurs in one step, remember that you can simply use the stoichiometry of those reactants as the exponents, as the orders that you raise them to in the rate law expression. If it's non-elementary, it gets a bit more complicated because some of those rate determining steps use intermediates that aren't part of the big overall rate expression. And what you have to do there is perhaps use an equilibrium approximation, assuming earlier steps equilibrate so that forward and reverse are happening at the same rate. And then that way you can then solve for the difficult piece of that rate determining step and re-express the rate as a function of those initial reactants. But remember that non-elementary reactions are ones where you don't always see the stoichiometric coefficients being used as the orders of those different reactants. And then finally, there are tables, and tables you encounter a lot. Get very comfortable with simply looking for a trial where one thing changes and one thing remains the same. And then realize that whatever happens to the rate, you can express it as the change of that reactant raised to whatever order it is. So if you double A and it doubles the rate, that's first order with respect to A. If you double A and it quadruples the rate, then that's second order with respect to A. If you double A and you see the rate go up by a factor of eight, then it's two to the third power. So it's third order, it's an eightfold difference. And if you double A and the rate doesn't change, that's zero order. And similarly, if you triple B and the rate triples, then that's first order with respect to B. If you triple B and the rate goes up by a factor of nine, then you're looking at three squared. And that's going to be second order. The squared is the second order with respect to B. But tables are very, very nice because they give you a way to experimentally derive this and then you can plug into your normal rate equation and solve for what K the rate constant is going to be. And so with this double agent model, there are a lot of different ways you can look at the rates and there are a lot of different ways you can solve them. But now you have all the tools necessary to answer rate questions when they come up in many, many different forms. So hopefully this helps.